Rebecca Burgess, welcome to the new school. Mm, thank you for having me. That's a joy. So uh, tell us about your work with natural fiber. Um, what is it that you do? Well, I currently work uh, at an organizational capacity, but my work with natural fiber is actually very personal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have worked with farmers and ranchers. A lot of people think fiber is related to fiber optics mm -hmm. or <laughs> mm -hmm. something you ingest, but the fiber system is a land base uh, that I'm relating to, really. And the fiber system that I chose to relate to was within 150 miles of my Fairfax home. And so my, my work within the fiber system was to define a strategic geography that I would look at and understand as a resource base. And mapping the resources of my home community was organized around the idea of I could get to a farm or a ranch or a land base within one day and come home within that same day meant that I could start creating an internal map of the topography of my community and understanding who is growing what and what is happening related to how I dress myself. And I call it a form of shelter. I don't really think about clothing as fashion or um, I don't even really think about it like a fiber system. I think about our clothing as um, primary to our survival. And I had some primitive skills teachers impart this on me when... A young woman said, um, I would die of hypothermia, even in a temperate climate like where you live, uh, before I died of dehydration. So when I'm out in the, on the landscape and I'm looking at life fundamentally as a human being, my form of shelter is the primary fundamental, and then in water, and then food. And so I reframed my, my understanding of fiber systems based on this primary idea of it being a shelter or a second skin and then how to connect that primacy of what we wear to the land. So what I do is really started again very personal in finding how I could create color and form from this landscape when, you know, in the face of this global industrial capital system which has moved resources with thousands upon thousands of miles. You know, we'll spin the cotton here and we'll ship it 17,000 miles here to be knit and then another 6,000 miles to be dyed and another 15,000 miles to get back to a distribution center and then another, you know, X amount of miles to get to retail outlets. And miles also denote this very desperate geography and a disconnect. So we don't understand impact related to these very, very... I would say, um, kind of a not, there's an anonymity or an anonymousness to this current supply chain. So I was trying to regain my sense of tracking uh, as a, you know, kind of a primal relationship to skin, uh, second skin, and tracking landscapes. And it was just such at odds with <laughs> what is typical that, um, you know, it gained some attention. But really, it's very fundamental, mm -hmm. ancient, and simple what I do. Um, I'm a natural dyer, and I, I'm a weaver, um, and I read a lot of things from Wendell Berry to primary source documents on carbon sequestration, and <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking about land a lot. Um, yeah. So you're wearing a very beautiful sweater piece today. Tell us about what you're wearing. So this was a sheep that, it's from wool which is from sheep, we'll start very simply. <laughs> and these sheep were raised in uh, Bodega Bay at a ranch, it's a 1500 acre ranch. It's a commune um, that was started with uh, draft resistors from Vietnam that all kind of coagulated in this little community that is still on the landscape. Um, they raise a lot of uh, sheep that are very drought tolerant, very resistant to um, disease, very hardy creatures. And there's a, a shepherdess named Hazel who lives there. And Hazel raises sheep that have a lot of Native American churro genetics and a lot of Corydale um, genetics, which are very good for our landscape. And so Hazel has been raising these sheep, I think, for 30 plus years on this landscape, 40 maybe. 
and uh, the color that I'm wearing is actually from the sheep. There's no dye. There's no synthetic fossil carbon or endocrine disrupting color agents. It's just the color of the animal based on what that animal's eating that day. Um, and the genetics of that animal turn the fiber white, gray, or brown based on, well, probably 30 million years of animal genetics. <laughs> so it's an expression of natural color. And then the blue stripes on this piece are from a species called Polygonum tinctorium, which is Japanese indigo. It's been known to create blue. It's one of 60 plants that do that. And then the pokeberry is the pink. Um, pokeberry is... Um, it's a pokeberry root is a strong, um, let's say, cleansing agent for the body. It's a, a very strong herb. It also can become very toxic, but it creates beautiful color just with vinegar and cold water. And the whole piece was actually knit by a single mom in San Francisco who grows all these plants in her San Francisco backyard. And she goes out to these ranches and she gets out of the city and connects with land and she collects wool as she's out there and she has it milled at a little research mill near UC Davis and this piece is an expression of really her relationship with the land. And you're also wearing denim jeans. Tell us a little about that. <laughs> so the denim is, um, this is our, our 90 mile supply chain expression of denim. It's a revisionist approach because it's, you know, we are sitting in the land of where denim was popularized. So I thought it would be very apropos to create some kind of revisionist approach to denim here because we're in the land of Levi Strauss. And when I started to do research in how to recreate this denim here, I realized that at the time of Levi Strauss's creation, it was around 1876 when aniline dyes, which are dyes that are based off of coal tar, which it took around 400 pounds of coal tar to make one ounce of blue dye. So around the time Levi Strauss was popularizing denim, aniline dyes had come onto the scene because the extraction of fossil carbon resources had become very simple and very, you know, oh, <laughs> this amazing energy source, so easy to extract. That had come through without any sense of the consequence. And so blue jeans were actually popularized with aniline dyes. We think of that time period as being natural or indigo, and, but very few of the denim jeans sold at the time were made from plant-based materials. So in, in light of trying to recreate and revise a, this approach to this utilitarian garment, I started to become a dye farmer. And I didn't think that would have to happen. <laughs> but I started farming indigo at a you know, pretty much a commercial scale. And it's certified organic polygonum tinctorium. And I go through a process that was popularized in Japan in the 1640s. So it's a very precise <laughs> way of creating blue, but it's plant-based and so it's biosphere-based. And so I farmed the indigo um, and I still farm. And this year, if we get El Nino, I'll be farming again. And the cotton was grown by someone that your brother wrote about in this book, <laughs> Eco Pioneers. Mm -hmm. now, um, Sally Fox lives 90 plus miles from here. And she was inspired by Rachel Carson um, back in the day. And she was an entomologist and a Peace Corps activist that came back to this country and started growing organic cotton. She was pushed out of many different communities because she was growing colored cotton. <clears throat> and that could cross-pollinate with the white supremacist cotton. <laughs> and so as a woman farmer, single mom, she ended up in the Cape Hay Valley where there was no cross-pollination contamination issues. And I found her kind of hiding out. Um, you know, it was one day, she was very open about it. She had just like had a mammogram and come home and was very sad. And I came to her door dressed all in her cotton and she hadn't seen anyone dressed in her cotton in decades since NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. <laughs> and so I, it was just this real live and neat moment for her. She hadn't been growing much cotton at the time. And so since our relationship formed at that time, she started to grow again and she's breeding again and she raises cotton that's actually brown and green. You don't have to dye it. So we used her cotton for these pants mm -hmm. and um, I only had to dip the indigo twice to really get this color. And then it was hand woven in Bayview Hunters Point. Uh, and then it was cut and sewn by a Levi's, a veteran Levi's pattern drafter in Alameda. And then we actually had a huge event celebrating the first 
We called it a denim CSA. And we had all these people prepay for their denim. And then they, we got it woven and sewn. And um, after all that farming had taken place, and then we brought those jeans back out onto the landscape for these early purchasers. And we had a huge celebration in Bolinas on October 3rd. And we brought all the farmers who were involved together, um, plus 86 different other farmers who'd made all these grass-fed tops. And um, so we just had a huge local food, local fiber party to commemorate that we can make things close to home. Mm. It's not an impossibility. It's far from rocket science. Mm. Now, I have your permission, because I asked you before, if I could ask you about what you do about underclothes. And you said yes. So tell us about underclothes. Underclothes. Well, when I was first trialing this idea of grown and sewn close to home, um, I did eradicate every piece of clothing from my wardrobe. And I started from scratch. And in the process of having all the fibers, dyes, and labor sourced within 150 miles, I had to, um, you know, construct swimming suit and because um, there are places that require that and socks and underwear. <laughs> and so in doing that, um, I realized underwear was challenging to grow and create close to home because it, we have a lot of wool in our community. <laughs> And um, our way of processing wool is very 1917, I say. Mm -hmm. A lot of the equipment we have to process wool is from 1917. So we don't have ways of refining. So I just went underwearless um, mm -hmm. for a year and actually six months. And then I really, but I missed underwear. Mm -hmm. I, I really did enjoy it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when I started reintroducing pieces, um, it was hard. I was telling you earlier, wearing conventional clothing felt like going and eating at McDonald's. And so think about what you, how you eat and how you take care of your internal organs. So you're that passionate about this. In other words, if you put on commercial clothes now, it's like eating a Big Mac or something. It's, it's like the, your response it's, is that visceral to it. It's that visceral. Yeah. It's completely analogous to yeah. me yeah. because the supply chains are not dissimilar. Right. They're actually very, the way that that beef is raised and the way that our clothing right. is created. Yeah, no, I get it. So what did you do? So I started to find companies that at least had certified organic, um, mm -hmm. you know, certified organic underwear I, for the bottoms. I brought that in because I know that, you know, there's a recent report out that certified organic cotton uses 90% less water than mm -hmm. conventional cotton. Mm -hmm. It has 46% less climate impact than conventional cotton. So not all cotton is the same. There's a huge difference between certified organic and conventional, mm -hmm. especially with the GMO and the 2,4-D and all that going on mm -hmm. with conventional and Roundup. So that I brought back. And then wool. Um, this is actually a wool that's been able to be fairly refined in its knitting. Um, and it's been descaled. 10% of the scales have been taken out so you can wear it next to your skin. And it doesn't have any of the 2,000 finishing agents that are reprotoxic or neurotoxic on it. So I've been wearing wool uh, and organic cotton underwear. But mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, I'm still slightly dissatisfied with that, but it's pretty good. And the reason I'm dissatisfied is because of the carbon consequences, the soil carbon consequences of, of orga organic cotton. Yeah. It's still a lot of tillage. It's a lot of tillage. Mm. I mean, a, an organic cotton farmer will have to water the landscape, let the weeds sprout, and then till again. They'll till, they'll water, they'll till again, they'll plant, which is another um, way to respirate more carbon dioxide out of the mm. soil. And then the weeds will start to grow and they'll pull up the weeds again with another pass. So while the conventional ag will just pass with chemicals, the organic farmer will pass with soil disrupting devices. Mm -hmm. And so from for the carbon consequences and the climate consequences of that are still better than using synthetic f compounds, but it's still not, we're not mm -hmm. quite there. <laughs> so um, you're not your, your average bear, as we say. Uh, you're not somebody who sort of takes a passing interest in environmental stuff. You're, you're uh, a yeah. little different than that. So how did you come to be this person? Tell us a little about 
your journey to this place? Where were you born? Let me just start there. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was born in the Ross Valley, which mm-hmm. is um, the Corte Madera Creek watershed, mm-hmm. also known as. And my family, my mother's side, had been in that region since about 1896. Mm-hmm. And I... My great-grandmother um, used to live in a tent cabin after the 1906 earthquake mm-hmm. in an area where kind of like Basage School is. It mm-hmm. used to just all be uh, brackish wetlands mm-hmm. that were very narrow. And mm-hmm. I have pictures of my family diving into these brackish wetlands and swimming mm. in an area now where no one wants to, because of synthetic compound runoff, mm. mm-hmm. No one will enter. So I had this perspective of a severe change in landscape in a way as a child, Mm. like being told these stories of swimming, being told these stories of how they could play in the landscape, how they Mm. were felt free and liberated in a certain way. My great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, these stories were passed down around how the landscape was. And then I observed what happened with the landscape as a child and just watching the dredging come, you know, the widening channels, levees going up, Army Corps of Engineers channelizing creeks. Now, did this upset you as a child? Yes. It did. Because you could watch changes in bird population as a child. You could see fennel plants taken out as they took the levees up, and then all of a sudden there would be no butterflies the next year. When is your earliest memory of being upset or unhappy with what was happening to the earth? Um, well, you know, sitting here, I can, I can look at, when I think about the memories, it was probably around seven. Uh-huh. And then I have letters that I was writing to county supervisors by the time I could write about what they were doing to my landscape. So that was really? like eight and nine. Mm-hmm. So give us an example of a letter that you wrote at eight or nine. Well, there was a threat that they were going to put a mini golf course um, across from Marin mm-hmm. General. Mm-hmm. And even as a child, you know, thinking, oh, miniature golf. You know, most mm-hmm. kids might be pleased by that. But it, again, it was, there was no buffer between what they were going to do and the pickleweed and the egrets and the, wet, the ducks, the mallard ducks. I mean... They were such friends, you know? So I wrote this letter saying, I I would appreciate, and I don't know if I use the word appreciate, but I would like it if you could please consider the fact that other creatures have a home here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, yeah, I just remember that. And so was that interest sustained through your whole life? I think so. So just kind of walk us through, what were the other... Like, what were you like in eighth grade in this regard? What were you kind of (laughs) doing in eighth grade about this kind of stuff? In eighth grade, I was the one kid who didn't peg their pants and wear guest jeans. Uh (laughs) Um, I wasn't listening to popular culture music. Mm -hmm. So just having a a kind of a... Being willing to not conform to Mm -hmm. external imagery that was important for peer friendship. Mm -hmm. I always felt like I didn't need to do that, and I didn't suffer a lack of friends for it. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like in eighth grade, because that's a really strong time when your, you know, cliques are very, very important and Mm -hmm. hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And so what I started to explore in eighth grade was how much can you pull away from this dissatisfactory popular culture, but still have enough of a bridge so that you Mm -hmm. have some kind of social network to play with and to Mm -hmm. hang out with Mm -hmm. on the weekends. You know, I was always dancing around that consciously Mm -hmm. as a child because popular culture was always an emphatic disappointment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the music alone just rubbed me the wrong way Mm -hmm. because I was brought up by a jazz musician father. So I was just like, oh, you're listening to Bon Jovi or I don't know what you're listening to, but I Mm -hmm. just... So there was, you know, the things that generally bring eighth graders together is pop culture, music, and the way you're dressed, and how much you're willing to experiment with certain drugs. So your father was a jazz musician. He was a drummer. Uh Uh-huh. What about your mom? She was a nurse's assistant. Mm -hmm. Um, So she um, became a a single mom when I was four. Mm. 
And so the Marin that most people are exposed to, the central Marin, um, mm. that was not my upbringing. <laughs> what was yours? Well, we had we had a little home near Dominican College mm. um, when I was very young, when I was like before mm-hmm. four. And then when my parents separated, um, I started spending a lot of time in my great grandmother's house, which is mm. the wetlands area. Mm-hmm. And my mom was, you know, just house sitting. We house sat and didn't have a place to live for four years. Mm-hmm. And so, so you grew up without a lot of resources. Definitely, mm-hmm. yeah. We just had a connection to the land, but yeah. we weren't cash rich or even at that point land rich. It was. Did your mom share your concern with the land? She did. She mm-hmm. did, and in a way that one can when she, you're a single mom trying mm-hmm. to raise a little girl and know where to live. Mm-hmm. But um, she did, you know, I remember when things would happen, like um, someone would threaten to develop yet another part of the ancestral homelands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I would hear her mumbling about it and just saying, you know, this is so disappointing. You mm-hmm. know, this is, this is a place where people need to, this is the commons, you know. This privatization of land mm-hmm. is not, this is not going to allow for the health of our community. And what were you like as a senior in high school? Ready to leave home. Mm-hmm. I mean, very much ready to mm-hmm. explore something different. And uh, a writer, like very much uh, a mm-hmm. writer for my school newspaper. Still concerned with the land. Yeah, a salutatorian at Redwood High. Mm-hmm. Um, there were many. I wasn't just one. Mm-hmm. Nothing mm-hmm. special about mm-hmm. it. You just had to have a high GPA. Mm-hmm. But I left for UC Davis, which wasn't very far. But the reason for that time, that Mm 18-year-old era, is um, I was going to be on the East Coast. I was Mm -hmm. going to go to Bryn Mawr, go to an all-girls college, and Mm -hmm. I got a pretty decent close to full ride. Mm -hmm. And then my father had been sick my whole childhood, Mm -hmm. and he got very, very ill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his health really started to... Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I think I should be close to home. Mm -hmm. But in that process of staying close to home, I ended up at a school, serendipitously, that had an incredible art program from the 80s that was still Mm -hmm. intact with this incredible agricultural and horticultural program. Uh, So this, and an emergent new major called nature and culture. uh, And I was like, oh. And so I learned how to weave. Mm -hmm. I really learned how to like, be on looms and construct textiles Mm -hmm. and drive a tractor. Wonderful. And have a liberal arts education Mm -hmm. with some mingling of hard sciences. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was formative. Yeah. Uh So what did you do after college? I started working as a weaver. Mm -hmm. And I was weaving textiles that had no synthetic compounds. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And in the process... Um, of staying in, at Davis, I lived in a very cooperative housing structure mm-hmm. so that we shared resources in a way that made it very affordable. Mm-hmm. But my first boyfriend was a jazz drummer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he needed to go back to San Francisco mm-hmm. to have a career. And in the summers, I had been working for an Alzheimer's patient who started the Green Revolution. Mm. He was a rice farmer. And mm-hmm. so all these summers at Davis, my summer job was caretaking his estate in Mendocino County. Mm. So I remember the last summer of college, being up there, taking care of Fran, you know, throwing literally a goat that had passed away like over a 40-foot cliff into the ocean and maintaining the land kind of single-handedly with Fran, who was 93 at the time. Mm-hmm. And I'd have to rope him to a tree while he weeded on the cliffs. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was a farmer who couldn't stop weeding. And, mm-hmm. and so I was up there alone with Fran, and my boyfriend came up and he said, you know, we need to go back to the Bay Area. And it was a real crux moment, because I had been offered a cottage at the neighboring estate mm-hmm. to stay there and weave and just become a Mendocino weaver. Mm-hmm. My life could have become very insular, contemplative, you know, kind of who I am would have mm-hmm. just been amplified in this little cottage on mm-hmm. the cliffs of uh, Westport, Mendocino. I came back to the Bay Area, mm-hmm. and uh, I, was, I was just like, oh, <laughs> I was fairly rattled by the move. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't afford to live as a weaver, let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. But what I was seeing in the Bay Area at the time was a lot 
of very driven parents Mm -hmm. wanting to educate their children and give their children all the experiences they could have. Mm -hmm. And so I started teaching young children how to weave and Mm -hmm. how to make natural dyes at like schools like San Domenico Mm -hmm. and Kent Middle School. And I started writing curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then I started going pretty advancing that curriculum pretty far. And then I saw what was happening to young children. I saw ADHD, ADD, or the pathologizing of it. Mm -hmm. I saw autism. I saw oppositional defiant disorder. I saw all these things going on on the landscape of schools where something neurologically had fundamentally shifted with children. And you made the connection to toxic chemicals. Absolutely. And (laughs) so there you were at this juncture point where... What has emerged for you is just like how vital it is to change what we eat, it is vital to change what we wear. And you've been in the forefront of that movement. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we talked about your your top and your denims. You also have a beautiful bag with you. Uh, can you show it to people and tell us a little about that? Yes, this is a a felted piece, which means it's wool that was just agitated with hot soap and water. It didn't have to be milled. It was just manipulated and agitated by human hands and feet. A woman named Catherine Jolda uh, from Oakland, uh, she invented something called a bicycle-powered carter. Mm -hmm. So she sits on a bicycle that she engineered. She's a young woman, um, she's like 32. And you can pedal the bicycle and move wool through this contraption and it combs the wool like it's combing your hair. Mm -hmm. And she um, then gets on her driveway and her Rockridge, her parents' Rockridge driveway (laughs) and um, uses hot soap and water and and a bubble wrap (laughs) <laughs> as an undulated surface. And it mimics Central Asian traditions going back five and 6,000 years where wool from yak and uh, even camels would be uh, laid out on surfaces and then rolled up into cloth and then a hot water would be poured over these fibers and then the fiber roll would be attached to the back of an animal and then an animal would get hit in the butt and then the animal would run around this surface and these fibers would get agitated as the animal ran across the landscape. And then the people would unroll this big, I don't know what you call it, but this, this roll of fiber would get unwound. And then you'd find that all that agitation of the bumps and the hot water that you poured had really allowed the protein fibers to adhere to each other. The scales on the fibers start to create knots. And this is one of the oldest forms of textile creation on our planet, other than skins and wearing hides. And, uh, you know, the Fertile Crescent, you know, in Iran and I, and still maybe in Iraq, they're still making beautiful rugs this way. That's very beautiful. Uh, for a listener, describe what it looks like. So it's uh, brown wool from the sheep, and it has some gray, and it was a, a churro cross sheep. Um, can I feel it? Yeah. <laughs> it feels like, it, it's like matted. How would one describe what this, in other words, it isn't a weave, is it, or is it? It's, it's just it's a, a composite, you might say. Yeah. So composite material or composite surfaces are created through fibrous materials or even woody materials. Mm-hmm. Like So if you've ever seen like a composite made out of, they use sunflower woody mm-hmm. shreds and adhesives to make eco cabinetry mm-hmm. and such. Those are just materials that have been smooshed together. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, they make them with adhesives. This doesn't require adhesives. It's just that the scales of the wool, if you look them at them under a microscope, there's these little, it looks like thorns. Mm-hmm. coming out of the wool, mm-hmm. each fiber, and then the thorns connect when a human agitates it. And through hot water and some cold water, the wool starts to shrink and the thorns come in on the, each other and mm-hmm. it locks. And um, You know, the experience I'm having sitting with you, having this conversation, it's like, and I think it may be true for others, but I'll speak for myself. Um, how can I say this without using trite 
metaphors, but there's a... Huh. I, what I want to say, which is just ordinary language, is that it's a deeply spiritual experience to be having this conversation with you. But if I were to try to describe what I mean by that, it's like sitting with you takes one down into a form of authenticity that's very different from everyday consciousness. That I'm sitting with somebody who is completely dedicating her life to recovering ancient ways of creating clothing uh, and um, has done this radical work in uh, working with a fiber shed uh, within, what did you say, a couple of hours of you, is that right? Yeah. And sourcing everything you wear, you know, almost everything you wear, to that fiber shed, right? And, uh, and then discovering all of these like-minded souls who create a network with you of people devoted to this work. So yes. somehow it's very powerful to sit with you, you know, in that Thank way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. What is that it like for described. you? <laughs> Thank you. What is it like for you uh, to sit in the middle of this network that you've created and do this work? What does it feel like to you? I started to have some perspective on that when I, I left for Colorado um, for the month of August mm -hmm. to work in an agricultural community near mm -hmm. Taos. And I finally had this moment of being away from this place mm -hmm. that's so much a part of my history. And to be pulled out of one's community, but you're consciously doing it, and then to kind of observe it from afar. I had the first experience of intense... Um, like a sense of loss or like that is, there is nothing I could do to quantify that community. There's no words for that. There's no metrics. There's no analysis I could do to analyze those relationships mm -hmm. and describe them other than, you know, to be, to, to exist for me is, is, I, I exist because of these relationships almost. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, I think in, um, there's some language, uh, one of my partners had once described a person as a person because of other people. And mm -hmm. you can take that a lot of different ways. It could be construed as possibly codependent or, you know, there, but it's an African, uh, it's a South African term. Is that right? Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Thank you. Thank you. And I had that experience of recognizing I am, you know, I am a person because of other people. Or I'm a, mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think person, I kind of look at Nizar Gadatta's work and I don't like the term person. I'm a human, mm -hmm. I, you know, stripped down from all of the egoic experiences or the identities or pieces and composites that I've grabbed onto. Stripping all that away, I am a human because of these relationships with other humans, plants, four-leggeds grasses, mm -hmm. hillsides. So, yeah, I don't know how to say, you know, you, you could, yeah, the contrite way was, was oh, deep gratitude, you know, mm -hmm. I recognize my deep gratitude, but it's, um, it's gratitude plus, there's almost like, I don't really exist without it. Mm -hmm. If you look five to 10 years ahead to where you feel this vision will take you, because how old are you now, roughly? Uh, 38. 38. So really, since you were four or five years old, you know, 33 conscious years, you've been following a vision. Yes. Uh, if you look five or ten years ahead, where would you like to be with this vision? I would like to be in a network of very successful and I mean successful in the fact that it's a group of happy individuals, the existing individuals I'm working with, the farmers, the ranchers, and the artisans, that their vision has been lofted in a way where we are bridging the indigenous spirit of the second skin, this is a big one, with mainstream super gulp culture. Mm -hmm. 
and you know that we've transformed we have somehow been able to bring this spirit of these pieces through carbon farming and the decentralization of manufacturing mm -hmm. through building a demand for this narrative that we've been able to dress more people and i think that i would like because these clothes carry a they carry a different vibration yes and the colors and you can experience it just being with you uh the experience of the clothing that you're wearing has an energy that I at least can feel. I think others can feel it too, you know. Yeah. And, and in, I think in Ayurveda, there's a term for um, prescribing clothing mm. as part of the medicine. I didn't know that. Turmeric dyed clothing uh -huh. has, is still being um, prescribed. Mm -hmm. for different conditions. And indigo dyed clothing was prescribed for a rigid mind or a mind habituated to unhealthy patterns. Uh -huh. And so I think if we bring the frequency of plant medicine mm -hmm. and the frequency of animal medicine, you know, I don't know what you <laughs> cry, but... Listen, tears are so welcome here. So that's what we do. We cry here. So your tears are welcome. Thank you. Take your time. I think there's some undigested grief. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Your tears are a blessing here. Thank yeah. you. Um, I think when I think about the future, it's there's a grief right now in the present with the chasm. Mm -hmm between where we are and where we need to be. Yeah. So, um, the hope would be that we would bring back a, a certain reverence and sacredness to the people and the plants that feed us and clothe us, like the fundamentals mm -hmm. of what we call a supply chain or what mm -hmm. we call a factory system, that there would be something sacred that can come from, from these fiber systems, which I know it can. I know something respectful and mm -hmm. sacred can come. And I would just want to increase the access points in the next five to 10 years that we find ways. And there's a lot of hurdles around ideas around cost, you know, mm -hmm. and putting price tags on things and working within capitalism. It's not a simple thing to work within the structures of the system we've created and offer these things and increase their access points. So no, I, think I mean, it's, they're, they're in a capitalist sense, it's tremendously time intensive to create these. That's right. So for someone to make any kind of living, even if they aren't trying to make a lot of money, at the level of artisanal, as they say, production, mm -hmm. uh, these are expensive to create. That's right. Yeah. So one obvious question that I know many listeners will be thinking about, your, your organization is called Fibershed, and um, uh, it's a membership organization. Tell us just a little bit about Fibershed. Mm. So Fibershed is focused on education, mm -hmm. economic development, and also some aspects of what we call community building. Mm -hmm. So we do teach people the skills uh, related to how to make their own pieces. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're trying to achieve overcoming this hurdle mm -hmm. of you know, having these pieces be more um, ubiquitous is by giving people their own skills to mm -hmm. do this work. That's the education program. Um, the economic development program is really actually looking at things fairly from a numbers perspective and going, okay, what's the economic feasibility of creating regional manufacturing centers? Mm -hmm. What scale of production do we need to exist at to make the clothing maybe like a bridge building situation where we know what people can access through what they're paying now, 
how can we take regional fiber? Because we're throwing away over 1.3 million pounds of wool in our home community right now. Mm. And 900,000 pounds of it is actually wearable. And the reason we're doing that is because we're producing animals for the meat industry, but we're not realizing that they, oh, thank you, <laughs> that they also have wool. And it's, uh, the wool is not being uh, seen for, as having value because all the wool in the world right now is produced in Australia and New Zealand. And this is what globalization has done. It's made whole countries responsible for one resource. So Australia, wool. New Zealand, wool. United States, our home community, plenty of wool. But nowhere to process that wool. So the economic feasibility is about looking at a supply chain that we could create for our home community to dress our home community with the wool that's currently a byproduct. So you said that you're using... Um equipment that's from 1917 or 1907, did you say? Yes. So if you're imagining uh, processing wool at a regional level, are you imagining that that is the technology or would you marry old technologies with new technologies? It's a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, to get this, the bridge that I'm looking to build is with pretty advanced technological systems mm -hmm. combined with mm -hmm. um, the ancient. And so... Have you prototyped those? We do. We have like a 200-page feasibility study, and we wow. worked with engineers in France, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, Germany. And I worked for a year and a half on this analysis, and I traveled a lot for it. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the blueprint of the floor plan, everything from you know where we would place the machines, how much each machine costs, what's the throughput, you know, relating the capital investments back to how much the... The, the plant could make per hour, how many living wage jobs are associated and with that. And what did you come up with? $26 million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a number, right? $26 million, and how much could you produce? We could produce, we could process 5 million pounds of wool per year, which is actually 2 million pounds of wool less than California is producing. So we could actually allow for more sheep to be on the landscape, and we are undergrazing some of our uh, lands, actually. There, it could handle more capacity from what I've done, and I've done an ecological assessment. of. Have you approached any entrepreneurs about creating this thing? We did. We went to the 11th Hour Public Related Investment Group, mm -hmm. uh, Rudolf Steiner Foundation, and all of them were very clear that there was a lot of room to do th this However, the demand side mm -hmm. needed to be fully established. And we'd only been able to get very peripheral agreements, purchase orders from companies like Ibex and um, Patagonia and North Face. You know, we, yes, we could buy this much, but the costs of the yardage that we could produce out of this mill would be around 20% higher than the global system. Is it scalable? Do you have to create the whole $26 million mill, or could you exactly. prototype a piece of it and see how it works? Yeah, you're, you yeah. hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really what we would like to do right now, is actually just start washing the wool, mm -hmm. actually, in a very... That's the Achilles heel of the whole mm -hmm. system. And I found a technology in the last six months that uses compressed CO2 mm -hmm. from the atmosphere and gets all the vegetable matter, sheep sweat, sheep manure off the wool without using water at all. Mm. And the engineers are in Littleton, Colorado, and they took an existing technology for dry cleaning that was gonna revolutionize dry cleaning in the 70s to reduce 100% of the chemical use in dry cleaning. Mm. And the chemical companies lobbied it out of the dry cleaning supply chain. So really? It's, 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 the company's called Tursus. You should ask them about how they discovered this technology. So it's been sitting on the shelf for 40 years, and we pulled it off the shelf, and we started realizing, they realized you know, that they could launder clothing. But when you actually break clothing down, it's fiber. So could you launder fiber? Yes. So we can do this without using water, which is such an advancement for our current scenario in California. And so the engineers um, are at the point right now where they're doing research trials in Littleton, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And to build demand, because that was also a component of the capital investments, what kind of investor can do this? <clears throat> 
if you haven't exactly proved that whole supply chain yet? Can you prove the demand for local cloth? So we got um, the parent company. I, I worked with the North Face to produce a locally grown and sewn garment. They made 5,000 hoodies out of Sally's cotton. Mm -hmm. And then I went to them and I said, now what about wool? Mm -hmm. And so right now, this parent company of the North Face purchased wool for the first time a corporation purchased wool directly from a farmer. It's never happened. Supply chains are designed so that brands buy finished garments and have no contact with the supply chains, mm -hmm. except maybe through some certifications they need to jump over hurdles and they, they make sure so-and-so is not hiring children and then they turn their back and so-and-so is hiring children again. You know, there's some relationship with the supply chain, but brands are marketing machines. So to get them to turn on a dime and to start actually engaging with the raw material was a revolution in itself. It had never happened. But I gave a lot of presentations in the boardroom about the importance of staying connected to the land and the climate and the impact that grazed ungulates could have if strategically grazed on the landscape to the carbon cycle and how we could make climate beneficial clothing. And we could roadmap that through life cycle assessment. And I brought in Berkeley scientists to prototype what the LCA would look like. It's called a biogeochemical LCA. And it thinks about sheep. What's LCA? A life cycle assessment. Okay. So we looked at the relationship between atmospheric and soil carbon in the analysis because sheep producing wool in itself is a manufacturing process. It's photon energy coming from the sun, igniting the carbon cycle, growing grass, which is a carbohydrate, it's carbon and water. The sheep come along and they graze a, what is carbon and water and they turn it into a protein. A lot of the carbohydrate is sequestered into the root system of those grasses. And when the sheep come and graze, the root slough and they sequester that carbohydrate into the soil, and that eventually becomes soil carbon. So we have a way of transferring atmospheric carbon into the soil with the help of ungulates, which are sheep and other uh, four-leggeds. It's a co-evolution process. It's been going on a very long time with the great herds, and that's how we've been building soil for eons. So, so what you're doing is looking at clothing, how we clothe ourselves, in a way that integrates uh, reducing climate greenhouse grasses, reducing toxic chemicals, and enhancing regional economic development. So those are your three, that's your triad, right? Uh, better for the climate, uh, better in terms of our toxic chemical exposures and all the hundreds, literally hundreds of diseases, disorders, and conditions related to the many hundreds of chemicals we all carry in our bodies, and then asking how you do this in terms of regional economic development. So okay. where do you get the resources to do what you're doing? I mean, is this grant supported, or what is it? what are the sources? Currently, it's 100% small family foundations. S small family foundations, uh-huh. And it's just myself and... Um, another full-time person mm -hmm. and um, a few, you know, we would, we kind of have a, an array of private contractors. Mm -hmm. So when we do feasibility studies, I bring on a graduate student um, in an MBA. Mm -hmm. I'll bring on an environmental sciences major. I'll bring on, we have a really great relationship with the Silver Lab at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, and now we also have a great relationship with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, Adams State University in Colorado, Colorado State University, UC Davis. So I work with, I bring graduate students in for some of the analysis, mm -hmm. guided by a professor or a department chair. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our work will be, you know, kind of the, the foot soldiers of this analysis. Mm -hmm. And this work is often done by... Um, Land grant universities in collaboration with our vision and our strategic vision is just hell. I kind of hold that and then shepherd the feasibility studies through the mm -hmm. door. But when I'm in the boardrooms, that's just me with mm -hmm. their data. Yeah. So when I listen to you, one of the things that comes to mind is what's called the maker movement among millennials. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, without holding on to categorical concepts like that, uh, how do you 
see yourself in relationship to the maker movement community? Mm. Well, there's aspects and skills that have been developed due to the maker movement that mm. I think are important to have in a society. Mm. You know, it's good that you have people learning how to make knives and learn how to weld again and mm -hmm. learn how to do small engine maintenance and farm their food and you know harvest their own turkey and their own chicken all of those fundamental homesteading skills plus the urban art scene have been mm -hmm. influenced by the maker movement mm -hmm. and so it's helping millennials i think track material culture But I think fundamentally society as a whole, including the maker movement, has completely lost sight of the carbon cycle and the hydrologic cycle. And so a lot of the maker movement is synthetic still. There, a lot of them are toying with synthetic biology. I mean, you go to um, South by Southwest and you'll have like all these grad students injecting uh, pigment-making bacteria into E. coli so they can make the next blue dye by, you know, these transgenetic creations or glow in the dark sheep that comes out of the maker movement mm -hmm. so that you can find your sheep at night mm -hmm. just in case you're wondering mm -hmm. where they were um, none of that to me is grounded in any kind of ethic of real life cycle assessment biogeochemistry carbon cycle I mean it's like so I think there's a, I, I think it's unfortunately too superficial for me to dive in too deep with most of it mm -hmm. however I am glad that there, are, there is an energy and an intention towards uncovering how something is made. Mm -hmm. So another experience sitting with you is just how remarkable you are in terms of how you've taken what could have been just done at an artisan level, you know, being a, a weaver, another Mendocino weaver, as you said, uh, but You've taken it this extraordinary path through. You're in these boardrooms. You're thinking about a $26 million regional, uh, you know, uh, production facility for, um, you know, for, for materials and so forth. You've costed it out. You've thought about climate, chemicals, regional economic development. How did you discover within yourself that you had the skills and abilities to think on this scale? I mean, was that always with you, or did you discover that over time? Hmm. Well, there was a little seed of it. Um, when I was a very young child, like four or five, I, this stays with me, and there's not a lot I remember from that mm -hmm. time, preschool era, but I was, because of my mom's scenario, um, not always in the same place. You know, I had my great-grandmother's house that I would get kind of put toward, you know, like after school, mm -hmm. there'd be this time where I'd go there. And I realized all these different houses and friends' houses and, mm -hmm. you know, just being punted around the whole central Marin area as mm -hmm. a kid. Kind of like that latchkey kid from the 80s. I never mm -hmm. was a latchkey kid, but... There was never any stability in, like, mm -hmm. one... The land as a whole was mm -hmm. really what I... Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't about one house or one nuclear family or one sibling. Like, I had none of those kind of 1950s attachments or that singularity attachment. It was like, the community is my home because everyone's kind of taking care of me. Um, and so I, there was a resolve in that where I noticed that I could always rely on certain people's skills to accomplish something even as a little kid. Mm -hmm. So-and-so makes me cinnamon toast, and so-and-so makes fresh squeezed orange juice. And depending on how I'm feeling, I am going to go here or there. <laughs> you know, in this apartment building that was one, my, not my great-grandma, my grandma lived in an apartment building, and I remembered navigating landscapes for needs and wants. <laughs> so you, you realized very early on, it sounds like, that you were going to have to take care of yourself. Oh, fully. Yeah. Yeah. So you understood that nobody was going to take care of you unless you took care of yourself. Yeah, that was the first big lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, from that seed, how can you describe the evolution of your sense of what you might be capable of as you think of it today, of this vision of recreating the, the whole way we relate to fabrics. How, how did that evolve within you, that sense of 
of your own potential? Uh, well, it came from those experiences of getting to perform didactic duties in the home with a great grandmother who was, mm -hmm. came out of the depression. Mm -hmm. So some of the skills that a child can glean when they're very young mm -hmm. and learning how to sew something or repair something, learning how to garden, you know, we kind of talk about this now in the vernacular of Waldorf education or uh, the movement to put a community garden or a pub, in a, to a public school mm -hmm. setting. But it was a lot more grounded for me in that it was like there was literally a depression era woman kind of uh, at my heels all the time requesting that I learn how to do certain things. Did you like each other? Pretty much. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I respected her greatly because she mm -hmm. was the matriarch, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so she... Was she someone you could trust? It, definitely, because mm -hmm. she was steady. Mm -hmm. She was a steady stater. Mm -hmm. There was no, like, there's no flappability there. Mm -hmm. um, she'd been through a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, the 1980s weren't her, mm -hmm. were not a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the 30s, that was mm -hmm. no big mm -hmm. deal. So I think how I came to the, or, you know, what, what my internal resources mm -hmm. are that I rely mm -hmm. on is mm -hmm. like, I can, I can make things. Um, that's fundamental. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, if I can't make it, I know someone who can. Mm -hmm. Just like you went from door to door. Door to door. And yeah. then if I can't find someone within the immediate sphere of already existing resources, mm -hmm. I can make a call out. And now given the world we live in with how networks are mm -hmm. being formed both in physical communities and virtually, I know that the resources mm -hmm. are there. And I'm not, I don't use this the virtual world for community building. I don't trust it as a strong mm -hmm. community builder. Mm -hmm. But I have met some amazing people through just a general email. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a grad student and I was hoping, you know, I could work with you. And then I find that her friend is the skilled person that would fit this need or that need. So I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It helps. Yeah. I want to open this for questions now. Would you please, if you have a question, say your name and keep the question brief if you have one. Anybody have a question? Yeah. Hi, um, Melinda Stone. We yeah. spoke on the phone last week. Um, I think one of those uh, moments where, um, you know, there was a reaching out. And I'm curious, I think this would also, there's other folks from Belize in the, the room in West Marin if you were able to find the acreage to lease for your next um, experiment with, with Indigo. Good question. Thank you. Um, I am looking for a half acre um, to farm the Indigo this year, and I haven't found it yet. <laughs> but I have a few more months. So I might really be able open. to help you with that. Thank you. And talk about it. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It grows well in Bolinas yeah. and West Marin as a whole. So. Yeah, no, I might be able to help with that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, my name's Joy, and um, I have a question about hemp. Can you talk about hemp? Sure. Uh, so it's just on a fundamental level. It's, it produces more biomass than pretty much any plant species we know of per acre. So like 500 pounds of cotton per acre with Sally's cotton, good biodynamic organic, and upwards of two to 3,000. We're, we're still analyzing the numbers because hemp's new to us again. <laughs> um, two to 3,000 pounds of fiber, textile grade fiber per acre. With, um, so the research trials that Fibersh had got involved in were with a veteran organic farming community in Kentucky mm -hmm. and a um, Pueblo Hispanic farmer in uh, South Central Colorado in the San Luis Valley. And we grew hemp in a very water-laden community, <laughs> 65 inches of annual rainfall per year in Kentucky, mm -hmm. six inches of annual rainfall per year in South Central Colorado. And of course, like any plant, even a cactus in Kentucky, I mean, it it get it, our first year it got nine between nine and twelve feet, um, and it obviously there was no irrigation needed because Kentucky has summer rains, but in South Central Colorado, we relied on the monsoon rains, and the first year in 2014, we watered twice 
with between May and September with flood irrigation, which is what the Pueblo and Hispanic farmers have always used uh, through the sequia system there. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to me to see that we got six and seven foot heights in an, at 8,000 feet elevation in sandy soils with a rocky bottom at 18 inches. So only 18 inches of a sandy loam topsoil watered twice. Other question? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, it's just from a biological perspective, it's um, it's one of the most exciting prospects. I have been legally, federally challenged by the DEA mm. several times, and I have dealt with black Cadillac Escalades coming to the farmers' homes that I'm collaborating with, mm. bleach blonde hair a mile high getting out with their cell phone, taking pictures, wanting to confiscate our crop asking us to destroy our seeds. The feds have been very, you know, but I'm just like, we're not, you know, the farmer I worked with was a land rights activist in South Central Colorado. So when the DEA came and asked us if we would destroy our seeds, we both said no. <laughs> so I think we're getting there with hemp, but just so you know, there's a huge political backlash because the Drug Enforcement Agency gets two, 200 million a year nationally to destroy the wild hemp that's been growing, you know, the Cherokee have it written in their, you know, their text when they transfer from an oral tradition to a written tradition, they write about the hemp for medicine, all the things we know about it to do now for epilepsy and um, cancer. Cancer. They were using it back then for yeah. those things. So. We actually have a, uh, uh, a, cha a, a new school healing circles conversation with Donald Abrams, who is the leading authority in the world on medical marijuana and uh, for cancer. And so uh, uh, it's a subject, I mean, I'm, let's leave aside the recreational use because I do have concerns for the growing brain and, you know, children smoking marijuana recreationally. And so I, I don't think that there's ever a free lunch in these things. I mean, these are powerful. And particularly with what's happened with cannabis, uh, you know, uh, grown artificially and with levels of potency that never existed before. It's not that there aren't reasons for concern, you know. That said, simply at a medicinal level, it's very clear that this has benefits for lots of situations and um, so I'm glad that the culture is moving on this issue but just on that as a question of uh, what is uh, given the law in California I guess you can only grow limited amounts for personal use is that where we are in California now yeah. and cannabis sativa is a yeah. you know genus species right. has so many thousands of different right, strains. Exactly. And so what we've been growing or what we've come to know within cannabis sativa is a, a branching shrubby species that produces off of each branch these large flowering heads. Mm -hmm. And that's what everything from the medicinal growers who have a right to grow, I don't know, six for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you get a bunch of people's permits, I guess you mm -hmm. can grow more. But that, that um, strain and all the breeding that's gone on mm -hmm. with that and all the synthetic compounds they mm -hmm. use to yeah. make that thing yeah. grow, none of that has interest to our organization or is very of use for textile production. So the textile version, does that produce a lot of uh, uh, psychoactive... only. Oh, excuse me? Cannabinoids only. Uh -huh. So I, I've heard that THC and cannabinoids yeah, in are, the plant are kind of inversely exactly. proportional. Yeah. So with hemp, it's just high levels of cannabinoids, CBD, CBN. Which is actually the ones that are most active anti-cancer, I believe. In other words, I yeah. know, I'm not an expert on this, but I know that the, so there are two dimensions of medical marijuana for cancer. One is the dimension that, uh, that gets you high, but the other with actual anti-cancer effects is the one that doesn't get you high. That's right. So what you're saying is that the one that you use for, uh, textiles. for textiles is the one that doesn't get you high, right? That's right. Which is the one that has actual anti-cancer effects. That's right. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
So, and in terms of uh, hemp as a as a uh, as a material for fiber, uh, how hard or easy is it to process and use to create clothes? In other words, is that a, <laughs> an easy thing or is it a hard one? It's mm, a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, you would be able to. If we were in a different time and place, mm -hmm. uh, and you had kind of a big farming family, like they had across the world mm -hmm. in many communities, processing the hemp. Like in this country, it was done by slaves originally, mm -hmm. but it was there were also people who would come and process your hemp or flax. Flax is another bast fiber, and they were known as the redders and the breakers and you know, population of young men would go farm to farm and they would um, they would break the hemp, which means mm -hmm. take the woody part and crack it mm -hmm. and then kind of get all that woody core off and um, cast the, the fibers across like a bed of nails and clean the fibers. Mm -hmm. And that would all be done by these roving ag agrarians who had a different job than the grower. They were mm -hmm. the processor. So that was a different era. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say that that couldn't come back, but right now what I'm looking at for, again, more that scale of production that is mm -hmm. the access point, I call it, scale of production, mm -hmm. that we actually need to find enzymatic treatments. So some of the fruit enzymes that are used, um, I think they're used for, I'm, I'm not sure how they're used in cooking, but let's just say we're working with you know, the basic fruit enzymes we're starting to do research with as applied to hemp to mm -hmm. soften the fiber. And what we've done is um, there's an engineer in Nebraska named John Lupian who developed in his garage a mechanical decortication system that runs off of hydraulics. Um, and we can feed the hemp stalks in and the woody part comes out one side and that's all your building materials. You can build mm -hmm. homes with hemp mm -hmm. from that angle. And then on the other side comes your textiles and your clothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then these fibers come out and they're very long. And right now in America, you know, we don't have what they call as long staple bast fiber milling. That was never on the landscape. We, be, we are a king cotton country mm -hmm. due to slavery. We organized our technologies around cotton which is basically because we organized our system around slavery. So our, cap, our structures of production are based on slavery. And so for us to move towards different crops, you're unraveling a lot. So this garage scale engineer, plus this chemist that he's working with, are, are trying to get the hemp so that we can soften it enough to run it on the existing American manufacturing equipment. And there's two systems. It's called short and long staple. Wool is the long staple equipment. We can process wool to a degree. And then there's the short staple, which is the cotton system. And that's in the south. We still have some very big cotton mills left. Um, this way of engineering the hemp, to me, you're bastardizing the plant a little bit to get it to move through these machines. But I think it's our entry point. How are you bastardizing because you're shortening the staple length. And in China and in Hungary and Romania, you see the old textiles, and they're from fibers that are like this long. They were able to spin these long fibers, and it makes your textile what I call heirloom. It would last 300 years. Some of the most durable textiles you could imagine creating are from the long staple. When you keep the integrity, anytime you keep the integrity of a plant, together, the more you keep it together, the better it's going to be for its end use. So the bastardizing is that you're shortening the length of the fiber. Yes, I, to, call, I call it bastardizing. How, how, <laughs> how much are you shortening the length of the fiber? Considerably. We uh, need to get it down to five to seven inches. As opposed to what, three or four feet? Three or four feet, and even longer. Mm. But the reason why we do this, imagine you're a farmer and the laws just changed in your state. And you have the ability to grow a crop that hasn't been grown in 65 years or 70 years. And you need a market. You cannot use your land and your water, especially in, uh, the initiative for California will be in play soon. And we are, I'm working on the, the language for hemp within the marijuana initiative. And as it stands, what I've constructed for that language is that a farmer will be able to grow a tenth of an acre. 
minimum, which it's for law enforcement so they can discern the difference between the bushy plant and the tall plant. If you're a farmer and you've got 4,000 square feet of this plant, you need to know you can send it somewhere and make at least something to offset your costs. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want the existing mills to be able to absorb that from the farmers in year one and year two. And when we build a market based off of that, I can start to use those quantifiable demand numbers around, okay, we blended hemp with wool and we sold this many tons of hemp this year. I can put that into an analysis to justify a mill that would honor the whole length of the plant. But again, those mills are upwards of $35 million. I know. <laughs> are there other questions? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Anisha, and, and um, I was really curious about what you said about the, the current wool production and the lack of use of what we have now um, and how it's related to, I think, a food system that's also broken. So we don't want to necessarily keep creating an animal for a food system that's not working, but to it seems like it makes the picture even bigger and a bigger challenge of working within people, uh, farmers that are producing wool in a way that is more sustainable, but then having that byproduct still that adds to the clothing piece of it. Can you mm -hmm. tell me how that piece, you know, doesn't become so huge that you could still look at it and work within it? So the, yes, yeah, so the main producers, uh, the large scale sheep producers are meat production as set, dated earlier. And so they're slaughtering most of their sheep in a place called Superior Farm Slaughterhouse in Dixon. And it, it, that slaughterhouse processes meat for the smallest family farmer all the way up through the thousand head flock of sheep. So I wouldn't say that our lamb processing system is necessarily just because you know, meat, the meat is harvested at this one slaughterhouse. There are a lot of people who feed into that slaughterhouse who, so if you eat meat, <laughs> which is a whole no different conversation, there is a way of processing the animals right now that allows the small family farmer to engage. Okay, so that, to me, that way of processing meat is allowing for small and medium-sized ranchers to exist on the landscape. You don't have to be in the industrial, it's not CAFOs, like contained animal feeding units or operations. Um, so, lands, so how sheep are grazed right now is they graze vegetable stubble and alfalfa stubble and they're moved around as grazers, hired grazers. So sheep are kind of different in terms of how they're used on the landscape compared to cows, um, but then they're harvested for the meat my producer community that is a part of our membership organization, we have people who pay to become part of Fibershed, and those ranchers and farmers, we have many of them who run non-meat operations. They are only processing the fiber, and they are waiting for the market to turn so that they can justify raising sheep without slaughtering them. But right now, the only entry point we have is to work with you know, just getting the meat producers to see that the animal isn't just for this one thing. The animal has a life that could nourish many aspects if harvested. And you don't have to harvest. That's a whole consciousness shift. Do you eat meat? <coughs> I do, highly selectively, because I was a vegetarian and a vegan for mm -hmm. oh, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Vegetarian, then vegan for a short stint, mm -hmm. and then strangely enough, incorp started incorporating meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I read Lyra Keith's book, um, The Myth of Vegetarianism, and I had already been thinking that a lot about my omnivore roots <laughs> mm -hmm. and looking at like what was happening to my own teeth mm -hmm. and starting, so just biologically, there was things happening for me that I wasn't able to, with even hemp oils and trying to balance omega-3, mm -hmm. 6, and 9 fatty acids, I, there's something wasn't working for me. And I'm not saying... There's a lot of amazing vegans out there that I'm like, how did you do that? And mm -hmm. I'm sure there's more I could study on this. But my personal decision was to identify exactly where that animal came from, who raised it, how it was raised, mm -hmm. and, um, and how it was slaughtered. And mm -hmm. I'm just very careful. And I eat meat probably once a week, mm -hmm. maybe like five to six ounces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What have I not asked you, or what would you like to tell us uh, as we begin to conclude that uh, we haven't talked about? Well, 
first of all, thank you. Mm. Um, and what haven't we spoken about? I, I think we've covered the climate piece. That's really where my heart is right now mm -hmm. is, is really exploring what we can do to sequester atmospheric carbon in our soils and how the fiber system in our clothing is so intricately mm -hmm. tied to that. And I really feel compelled to just move forward on climate beneficial clothing based on the life cycle assessments we know that could work if we were to graze this way and treat the rangeland mm -hmm. this way and process the material this way and getting VF's corp this corporation support and moving the wool, we can start establishing a demand. And need, I wanted to mention that the ranch that VF purchased the wool from, the rancher is very conservative. Beyond anything that exists currently in the Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino form of conservative. Um, very northeastern part of the state. They consider themselves part of Nevada, not really California, even though they're in California. And to work, to build a bridge between how I feel about the earth and how they work with the earth was is and was a very interesting mm -hmm. bridge, mm -hmm. and it's still happening. But this ranching family saw what happened in the face of drought to their ranch, and they saw what was starting to happen to the health of the animals. And I brought the word climate into our conversation, and there was a recoil for the first time, but slowly but surely, I brought to them the fact that there was a corporation that wanted to buy wool, but only if that wool was from animals that had been treated this way mm -hmm. and were c coming from rangelands that had been treated this way and a ranch that had a carbon farm plan that we, were in we would have to increase carbon capture on their landscape, which mm -hmm. meant increasing photosynthetic capture, which meant no bare ground, plants, strategic grazing, fences to keep the sheep and cows out of riparian corridors. Mm -hmm protect the land. And when they saw that they could double the price of the wool if they did this by the, the land, the business perspective kicked in mm -hmm. and that excited them. And now they're adopting an entire carbon farm plan because they're seeing that if they don't increase carbon capture on their land, they're going to have to pay for carbon in the form of hay and straw coming from someone else's ranch. So I'm watching... I think what I'd like to just say is that there's such a beautiful moment right now when we work in regional economies and we share values around land care and you can cross amazing political divides and I'm experiencing it firsthand in a way that I, I just, it's hard to describe, but really like very, very amazing to see people open up to, to a form of stewardship that we can all share the same vernacular around. Mm -hmm and that a fiber system could mean this, mm -hmm. these shared values around how we care for something. Mm. Do you say Burgess or Burgess? Burgess. Burgess. Yeah. Rebecca Burgess, the founder of Fiber Shed, uh, author of Harvesting Color. You have a new book coming out next year on what? Fiber Shed. On Fiber Shed. <laughs> Um, it's been powerful, moving, and wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much for being with us at the New School. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm.